Heads up guys, my name is Achano. Welcome back to another Hazel Devlog. I thought that I would take things in a very chill manner today. I'm not very chill though. I thought we'd be nice and chill today and just talk about what I've done in the past two weeks, like a traditional kind of devlog. So as most of you probably know by now, because I keep saying it, my goal currently for Hazel is to get it to the point where I can start making games with it, which I mean, it's a game engine, so that sounds like a pretty standard goal, but especially for kind of 2D. And even though Hazel Dev, which is primarily like the development version of Hazel that I'm working on, that does support 3D and we have 3D rendering in there, the workflow for both 2D and 3D is more or less the same, at least when you break it down to the core components of what makes up a 2D and a 3D game workflow, like they still need to be able to, for example, save and load scenes and interact with like scripting languages and do all of that stuff, entity component system. That's all the same whether you're working on a 3D game or a 2D game. So therefore the engine's workflow is very, very, very similar. So I've gotten to the point where we have an entity system in Hazel. We have C Sharp in Hazel we can basically more or less put together pretty complicated games even because by exposing enough of the C++ code to the scripting language and by writing some of your own code in the scripting language, you can actually do quite a number of things. But the problem is that whilst all of this exists in the scene, in the editor and can be quote unquote played, there's no way of saving it. You open Hazel, you build your game and you close Hazel and the game's gone, that's it. There's no, there's no way you can actually save your scene. Furthermore, since there is no way to save the scene that you've created inside the actual, like, editor, there's no way to actually play the game as a standalone game. All you can do is experience it through the editor while you're working on it. There's no actual way the runtime can actually play the game because the scene only exists within the editor. And of course, that's a huge issue. So basically what I did over the last couple of weeks was created a system for us to be able to serialize and deserialize scenes as well as actually hit a play button in the editor to play the game. This one system is quite large and it ends up solving both of those problems. On one hand, it lets you actually save a scene and then load a scene in the editor so that you can shut down the editor, open it on a new day and continue working on your scene. But it also allows you to actually play the game because the scene can then be loaded by the runtime and played. That's a really important distinction. And to be honest, I could spend the next hour talking about how all of that works and all of the little things to consider that comes from not only just serializing and deserializing scenes, but also being able to actually play them in the runtime whilst editing them in the editor and link that all up into the scripting language. And there's a lot of stuff. And I want to eventually take you guys on a, a little bit more of a technical deep dive onto how, how I orchestrated this entire system and the amount of time it took, which was quite a while as well, putting all the pieces together, testing everything. And it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty much at the point where I can at least see the end and it's mostly working. And if you want to see an hour long discussion about this, just let me know in the comments below and I'll happily sit here and talk for ages. But for those of you who don't, don't worry, this video is not going to be that long. What I'll do is I'll actually show you this working in a minute here. But first I want to talk a little bit about, no, this isn't a sponsorship. It almost sounds like a sponsorship, doesn't it? First, I wanted to talk a little bit about some considerations when it comes to an actual scene format. And by that, I mean specifically like a file format. How do we actually save a scene? What format are Hazel scenes saved in and why? So when it comes to picking a file format, there's, there's two major considerations to make. And this is very broad. So I might make a video in the future talking a little bit more in depth about all of this just outside of the context of even a game engine. But essentially we have two different types of files. We have a text file and we have a binary file. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. Binary is extremely fast for the computer to process. It's also extremely easy to just write out a bunch of binary data from C++ into a file and also load it. It's dead simple if you have a struct of data that's just, you know, kind of all kind of packed together inside that struct. None of it's kind of directing to other pointers or other memory locations. You can just dump that whole memory to a file and done. Then you can load it on any computer you want. You know, once you deal with some big and little endian problems, but we'll ignore those. You can load it on that computer and then just, it's just gonna be just put it into memory and you're basically done. It's super easy to deal with. However, humans can't really open that file and read it. That's where text files come in. With a text file, you can easily just open it in Notepad and look at the data there. Now, that does come as a consequence to the fact that it's harder for a computer to read. If you have to decipher a string that is a float and then kind of convert it into a float and go through every field manually and make sure the value is set to the right thing and convert it into a string and convert it from a number into a string to serialize it, 
that's a lot of work and that's kind of difficult and time consuming for a computer to do, but it's better for humans. So what do you pick for a game engine? And the answer is both. On one hand, when you're actually dealing with the process of producing the game, so in other words, you're editing a scene in the scene editor, you want that to be a text file. Why? Because you want to be able to open it and read it. Why though? Why would I want to read my own level format in Notepad? And the answer is you probably don't specifically want to read it in Notepad, but when you're collaborating with other people or even just with yourself and you make updates to it, or if two people are working on the same scene file, when it comes time to actually consolidate those two kind of divergent copies, you can actually just merge them using any kind of text diff tool because everything's in text. So you can clearly see what entities have been added, what transforms have been changed, all of that stuff. You can, you can easily just read it as a human and decide which parts to take to combine that and resolve all of those conflicts. Even if you're working on your own, you can go through your Git history or whatever version control you're using and actually see what has been changed in the level. It's really easy and it's definitely not doable if you're using binary. Of course, you could write a custom binary tool to do something like that, but that's just overkill. So long story short, in the master version of these files, which is what you're doing while you're actually working on that level in production, you want that to be a text file. However, when it comes time for your game to actually run outside of the editor, perhaps, and actually be distributed and published and shipped and all of that, you want it to be binary. Because first of all, you don't need anyone actually looking at the level. In fact, you might even want to protect that, but also you want it to run as fast as possible. And since we don't need any of the benefits that come with text files, it is a lot better to just have that be binary. It'll be smaller. You can compress it even more. I mean, you can compress text as well, but that will make it not readable. It'll be way faster for the computer to actually load that and process that as opposed to if it was a text file and it needs to convert all of those strings into actual, into like the right format. So in other words, text and binary, both of them are great. Both of them have their uses and that's what you need if you want a good scene system for a game engine. So anyway, let's actually go to Hazel now and take a look at what it's like to kind of put together a scene in Hazel and then maybe save it and load it again and actually hit play and maybe something will happen. Okay, so what I've done here is just opened up Hazelnut, which is Hazel's editor, and I have not loaded any scenes at all. So what you have is effectively, at the moment, a completely blank canvas. You just have a grid which you can toggle with Control G and that is pretty much it. From there, you can load an environment map to give it some color and a background and a skybox, and then you can also create entities inside the scene hierarchy. But what we're gonna do is we're actually going to load an existing scene. So I'll just go file, open scene. And then I have one here that I've made called pink sunrise. At the moment, the extension is .hsc, which stands for hazel scene. So I'll open this. And here we have the scene being loaded in here. So this is just my kind of test scene that I've been using for a while now. That's just demonstrating different materials being on different sub meshes. We can still, you know, move this around as usual. And you can see here we have test entity. There's also an unnamed entity, and that's just more of an internal thing that actually is like an entity that makes up the scene itself. But inside test entity, we have this actual entity and you can see it's made up of a name here. It's got a GUID, some kind of unique identifier. It's got a transform, it's got a mesh component and it's got a script component, which links it to a script. And I think at the moment, the script will just continually move it, I think in a certain direction based on what this speed is. So if I set the speed to one, these variables here, by the way, are just public fields written inside the C sharp script that are just being automatically exposed. So now what can I do with this? Well, at the moment, this scene has no camera. So if I hit this little play button up here to run it, we're not actually gonna see anything. So what I'll do is I'll add a camera. I'll right click here, create empty entity. Here I have my empty entity. I'll rename it to something useful like camera maybe. And then I'll add a camera component to it. Now this stuff is very primitive at this point in time. I literally just slapped this in like yesterday, but if I add the camera here, I can set the projection type to perspective or orthographic, which will give it some different properties here. It's got a, it's got a default field of view of 45, which is pretty standard vertically. I can't actually see the camera in the scene because it's not a mesh. So it doesn't have like a bounding box or any visual representation. In the future, of course, it will have some kind of icon and probably just like a bounding box or something that shows the actual projection for Austin. But at the moment, there's no way to actually see it or really manipulate it. I mean, I could translate it and rotate it, but that's probably not going to do much. Maybe I'll just move it back a little bit. But ultimately what I wanna do at this point is probably hit play and see what happens. So if I hit play, it's gonna run my scene. And you can see it's wherever the camera is. If I click on the camera, I can still actually 
edit it and manipulate it and do whatever I want with it here. And the scene, of course, is playing, which is pretty cool. If I click on test entity, I can also see the transform actually changing in real time. I can hit the play button again and it's gonna stop the scene. We'll jump back to the editor camera, but you can see that at the moment, the scene has not been reset. That's because anything that happened in the scene at the moment is actually kind of stored in the scene because it's all one scene. It's not like when you hit play, it creates a new scene and then starts everything like that. And when you hit stop, it reverts back to the editor scene. They're actually one scene at the moment, which is why you see this whole movement here. So yeah, definitely something that I need to work on because obviously resetting the scene is something that is likely going to be very important. Now, let's say that I wanted to add another object into the scene. I can create an empty entity here. I can add a mesh component to it. I can load a mesh. So I'll load this sphere 1M mesh here. And then I'll zoom out a bit because it's huge. I can scale it down. Maybe I'll just put it over here and I can run my scene again. And you can see we now have a sphere in our scene as well. So that's basically what we've got inside Hazel Dev, the ability to kind of play these scenes as well as edit them. It's, it's kind of getting there. There are still a lot of features to add and so many things that I could do. Oh, and of course the saving loading thing. So I can save this scene. Let's save it as pink sunrise modified or something like that. I'll hit save. I'll open the old scene, which is this. This is before we had even a camera or anything like that. And then I'll open my pink sunrise modified scene. And you can see I get back here and I can do various things. I mean, I can even change the environment map to something like Birchwood 4K. Maybe I'll load a different HDR map. I can save that as pink sunrise modified here. And then if I open pink sunrise again, we'll snap back to where I was. And if I open the modified version, you'll see that we have the new environment map and everything basically has been saved. And I can of course play the scene and you can see that my scene plays. Okay, so I, oh, hang on a minute. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button below because it does help me and this channel out. Speaking of helping me out, if you wish, you can also help support Hazel and my YouTube channel and everything I'm doing by going to patreon.com forward slash the churno. You'll get access to what you just saw in the Hazel development branch. You'll also get access to weekly live streams where I work on that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in all of that and you want to help Hazel and me out, then thank you so much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. Hope you guys are all doing okay. And I will see you soon with a new video. Goodbye.